Good afternoon, everyone. So glad to see everyone here. Um, first of all, I just want to welcome everyone to the Ideas Series uh, performance today. It's a very special show. My name is Lei Liang. Uh, I'm artist in residence here, uh, research artist in residence. I think that's the correct title. And uh, I would like to say that today is uh, the first of a three-part uh, uh, series that uh, en engages music, art, and the uh, oceanography. Uh, and I feel this is a very special uh, collaboration that this institute has facilitated. And uh, the first person I want to introduce to you is um, Josh Jones. Uh, please come up stage. Uh, Josh is a graduate student now at uh, Scripps. And um, he, is, he got his um, BS, Bachelor's in Environmental Systems from UC San Diego, and he's finishing his PhD. The reason I want to introduce Josh first is because um, uh, I got to know Josh uh, only about a couple months ago, uh, um, basically because of his research with his advisor, John Hildebrandt. Um, and Josh has uh, stimulated such interesting discussions in, in a seminar that I'm teaching with about 22 uh, PhD students in music. And the kind of stories he was telling us and the materials he brought us uh, help us to imagine uh, uh, this whole world around us in a very different way, challenge us to listen differently and to find new meanings in sound and the action of listening itself. So I just want to say that um, Josh has been a major force in stimulating all of these uh, very unlikely kind of collaborations, but they have been very, very productive. And the next person I would like to introduce is Peter Fay. Please come up stage. Peter Fay is kind of like a legendary person for me already. <laughs> so I've, I'm very excited to see him uh, for the first time in person. Uh, Peter is, uh, he got his bachelor's at the College of Natural Resources at the University of Wisconsin, where he also studied jazz guitar. Very good combination. He earned a MAS in climate science and policy from Scripps. And, uh, and he, uh, he, he worked with Josh uh, and, and his collaborators at the Whale Acoustic Lab to understand and utilize raw acoustic data streams. Uh, he t currently teaches math, science, and music at a high school in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I was introduced to Peter's work uh, 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 when I was having my first conversation with Josh, and I was really blown away by what he did. And, um, it took several years to try to finally get to meet Peter, even though he has been doing these incredibly interesting works here at UCSD. So I'm very, very happy that you can share with us uh, today what, what you actually, uh, the very ingenious ways that you combine the data into a very, very interesting experience for everyone to understand science from a different perspective. Next, uh, I would like to introduce Josh uh, Tonais, uh, a visual artist on the team. He's a lecturer on record at University of San Diego and UC San Diego teaching, uh, teaching courses in film, video art, animation, and studio arts. I just heard that what he de did recently with this project can move you to tears, and I'm very, very excited about that. Uh, the last but not least, Catherine Chu, who is a proud undergraduate here at UCSD. She's uh, uh, a visual art undergraduate, and she's creating a, a re realistic animation, including the beluga whale for Arctic immersion. So let me give the floor to, to all of you. Um, thank you. Yeah, sure, I can, I, can, I, can, I can do this. Hello, oh, okay, hi. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, Leigh. Um, and the opportunity to, um, yeah, to be here to share this with you. I think um, the, I, I guess the, the place to start is with the um, this concept that sound is really what what brings us all the the four of us the five of us now in this bigger group um, at UCSD together, um, sound in the world of the animals that live in the ocean is is super important. Um, I'm a graduate student, as Lay said, uh, down at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I work in a group called the Whale Acoustics Lab, and we use sound as the primary way of learning about a whole bunch of different animals, mostly marine mammals, um, because for these animals underwater, sound is the primary way that they uh, navigate, they find their way around, um, that they can hunt for food, um, and that they communicate with one another in these rich 
social lives that they have. And so, um, uh, what's this? <laughs> we can't be everywhere in the ocean um, all the time. And so one of the ways that we, uh, that we observe places in the ocean and these animals is to um, deploy underwater recorders. Um, this one is a high-frequency acoustic recording package. And what they do is they, they sit underwater, we drop them off of a ship, and they go down to the seafloor. Like, you could imagine me standing on the seafloor and the instrument next to me. Um, and they suspend a hydrophone, an underwater microphone, um, above the seafloor. That's this thing right here. It's filled with oil, and it has a, um, a thing inside of it that when it, sound hits it, it turns it into an electrical signal and stores it inside this pressure case here. In, um, in my work at the Whale Acoustics Lab, I'm focused mostly on the sounds of animals in the, um, well, and animals themselves in the Arctic. And so we've been um, occupying a place in the uh, Chukchi Sea, which is north of Alaska and in between Alaska and Russia. We've been occupying this place in the Chukchi Sea with one of these, in fact, with that very hydrophone right there um, for a number of years and recording continuously underwater sound for a year at a time and then find some way to get out to this place. Typically, it's on an icebreaker and you can go only during the very limited time of year when there isn't ice and there's open water and a boat can go there. And you go on one of the very few boats that can go to a place like that and take this instrument and drop it in the water and leave it to sit on its own in the dark, under the ice for a year, come back, hopefully it's there. You send an acoustic signal and it drops its anchor and comes back to the surface with a year's worth of data in it, a year worth of them of sound recordings. And then, we, uh, and then we do something with that. We try to learn about the ocean and the animals, and we'll get to that a little later. So um, this is going to be a bit of a, uh, an exercise in imagination. So imagine now that we're a thousand feet below the surface of the Arctic Ocean in the Chukchi Sea. And above us is a ship. In fact, that's the sound of the ship that you're hearing right now. It's the icebreaker Healy, just shortly after the deployment of this instrument in 2015. And you can hear the propellers, sort of and you can hear the, the diesel electric generator, and you can hear the echo sounder every so often, ranging the bottom. And, and this is the space that we're going to be in for the next year. We're going to abandon the instrument and the audience for a year, but you can't sit here for a year. And so this, what we'll experience is a time lapse of sorts. Every second of the sound and the, the imagery that you're going to see is a representative of one day. And so for the next 365 seconds, we'll hear a year underwater in the Chukchi Sea in the Arctic.
your silence reminds me of the way that I feel when I listen to this. It's actually fairly terrifying. <laughs> um, what we like to do is to introduce now that now that you've been immersed and abandoned for a year um, in the in the Arctic in this place with a whole lot of unfamiliar sounds um, to go along with the imagery that Josh Tanias has, has made. And we'd like to introduce some of the cast of characters that comprise this soundscape. Um, and, and I'd like to first point out that, um, in case we didn't make it really clear before, we're together doing this project because Peter Fee came uh, a year and a half ago and did a master's um, down at Scripps. And for his project, he, as a musician, decided that he wanted to try to, to collect all these sounds that we've been listening to individually, as that's the sound of a beluga and that's the sound of ice, and to put them together into context and to do it in a way that was quantitative, that was really representative of what was present in this one year of underwater sound and when. Um, and so all of this, the, the sound that you heard, that's all uh, Peter's production work. Oh, characters. <laughs> so one of the sounds that you heard um, in, at certain times in this recording was the sound of a bowhead whale. And these are large baleen whales that migrate through the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. And they're, oh, I don't know, they're sort of two times that size. They're big. And they break ice. They navigate somehow through areas that are 100% covered with ice or just with tiny little open leads and somehow they find that open water to breathe and where there isn't open water they can break ice that's up to three feet thick and breathe through the hole that they make and somehow these animals um, thrive in this area. Um, they're, they're going to the trouble to breaking this ice and, and living in this really dangerous environment so that they can capitalize on one of the um, the most abundant sources of food for a marine or animal uh, in the world, and that would be the zooplankton, the phytoplankton, and then the zooplankton bloom um, that occurs in the Arctic Ocean in the spring. Um, now, there were some other uh, characters that you might have heard. Um, also, incidentally, bowhead whales, I don't know, many people under hear and know that humpback whales sing these long, complex songs um, that are repeated and sort of musical. And bowheads also sing songs, and that's what we heard from that animal. I, I'm not sure if this is true. I, I yeah. read somewhere that the humpback whale is like a classical musician, and the, the bowhead is more like a jazz musician. It's not predicted what's going to play. I don't know if that's true, but that's, I read that somewhere. Is that right? <laughs> so, I, so many things I would never think about <laughs> if I didn't get to talk to you all the time. Um, so, so Catherine uh, on our team has, um, has produced these animations to help us visualize the animals themselves. And somehow through some magical process, you've, you've created living um, animated versions of these animals. And so this, uh, this is the beluga whale. And you can hear the belugas are a common feature of the underwater environment in the spring and in the fall, right around the time when the ice is sort of starting to break up and open up just a little bit. And around the time when the ice is starting to form, that's when belugas show up in this, this place 160 kilometers from the nearest land, way out there. And, and they're in big groups. There'll be 50,000 belugas in this one population alone that will pass many or most of those belugas will pass by this area where we're recording and they come by in groups of tens, twenties, hundreds and even sometimes thousands of animals and they're continuously, when they're present at least as far as we know, when they're present they are making sounds like this whistles and beep squeak sounds and robot sounds and whatever it is but they have a very rich acoustic repertoire and so this is probably a group of belugas passing by the site. What else do we have? 
Uh, so those are the those are the two whales um, that we would commonly see or hear. If we could be there, we can't be there. To, nobody can be there in the winter or the spring or any other time except for open water. But um, but whale, those two whales are the are the predominant ones, belugas and bowhead whales. Um, but but then there are the um, seals, yes. and these uh, animals the are um, they're ice obligate. They live <laughs> in the sea ice um, almost all the time. And really critical functions of their lives are performed on the sea ice, like for walrus. Oh, this is a ring seal. Um, <laughs> ring seals somehow, this little animal, you know, they're, they're hardly bigger than the pressure case here. They live um, in the ice all winter. They overwinter in ice. They're continuously hunted by polar bears. They live underneath the snow in these subnivian layers that they, they dig out. And they maintain breathing holes in a perpetually freezing Arctic ocean with the claws on their foreflippers. One of the little Easter eggs in the uh, soundscape that Peter made is there's one point in there in the middle when there's a lot of ice noise. That would be the winter, the deep, deep part of the winter, totally dark. You can hear <coughs> And the amazing thing is from the seafloor, a thousand feet away where the surface is, we're still able to very clearly hear the sound of one ring seal with its flippers going <coughs> trying to keep its breathing hole open so that it continue to access food and breathe. Um, and then there are other species of, uh, of pinnipeds or seals, like the walrus. I don't know if we have... <laughs> I love this animation. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think there's ever been an animated walrus or ring seal ever. <laughs> uh, I hope it makes more sound. <laughs> yeah. Now I realize I should have shut up and let you listen to the other ones. Uh, so, whatever, two-ton animal, 20 feet long or 15 feet long, something like that big tusks, all blubber, and somehow it makes a sound like boing! <laughs> and they make another sound that's not in here. They, well, they make like 20 sounds, but they also, they, they go meow. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so walrus are another species that, that really live and die by the ice. Um, the cows have their, their pups, and then they'll, traditionally, typically for walrus, they'll put the pup onto, um, or calf, onto a piece of ice, a flowing piece of ice. And then they'll, that ice need to be over shallow water where the animals go down and dive. And they feed for, on clams and crabs and invertebrates in this super rich mud on the seafloor. And then they come straight back up and they get back on the ice and they'll feed their pups or their calves. Um, the world's changing for Arctic marine mammals and walruses are, one of those examples. This place where we're recording, the Chukchi Sea, is one of the places where we see sea ice and conditions in the Arctic changing most rapidly. Um, this was a place where not that long ago, in fact, in, in, in the memory of people who live in Barrow, which is the town on the top of Alaska, the northernmost town in, in the US, most people can remember that during the summer or the fall, you could go out in a small boat and you could find the ice edge, and you could go hunt bowhead whales, and you could go hunt walrus if you lived in the town of Point Lay, just to the west of there. But now, the ice edge is 200 miles away. It's receded, the summer ice edge has receded so far away that nobody can reach it anymore. Um, and so, what you see with walrus, for example, is that rather than there being pack ice floating over their feeding area now, where they can, in the summer, put their, their calves on it. Now all of the animals are coming to shore, and they're having their calves on shore. And so in big giant piles of walrus are showing up where there never were any. And the females and are, are having to go swim long distances to go and forage, and then come back and feed their calves. And, and there's a lot of uncertainty about um, what the overall impact might be on walrus and on other marine mammals in the Arctic from these changes. And so it's one of the reasons why we're, we're there sort of working on this. Um, I'd, I'd like, if we have, if we have, 
to, oh, oh wow, beard, okay, bearded seal, there's another, <laughs> another feature of your Arctic environment, let's try it. quite done. <laughs> there you go. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's, one, that's one call um, made by a, a bearded seal. So the bearded seal males will um, sit on the edge of the ice and they'll paint, kind of pick a favorite spot and then they'll go dive down, not very deep, and they'll make these displays, these acoustic displays. And they do one breath hold, and then they sit down there, and they go, they blow bubbles, and they make these sounds. And some of the individual sounds on one breath hold can be almost two minutes long. And so you can you can actually hear it in the animals. It's sort of act breathing and making sound and continuing, and then you get down to the the very end, and you're just like trying to get a little more out. This is some sort of a display that must mean something um, to the females for their for their mate selection. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, in the, oh, there's one more uh, really important character in this, uh, in this soundscape that I, and I hope, I'm sure we're going to have time to listen to it one more time. Um, and that's the ice itself. The, probably the predominant factor in not only in the lives of these animals, but also in the underwater soundscape is, is the ice. And so in open water, you, Sound travels much farther, it doesn't scatter as much, it's sort of, you can hear all the waves, and it sounds actually like this. Um, this would be regular kind of open water sound. But the ice itself, it makes sound. You can hear, when the deployment happens, it's open water, but maybe a month later, the ice starts to form, and you can actually hear in, in Peter's soundscape the sound of the ice as it just starts to form, this little thin plates of ice sort of grinding against each other. And you can hear it thicken and crack and start to become thicker. And then big plates of ice will scrape against one another and pressure will form inside and the ice will squeal and wail. And ice plates can buckle against one another and form ridges and break house-sized boulders of ice. And as the, as the ice season progresses, you can hear that as well. And somehow, these animals are living in the midst of all of that. Oh, this is the ice. So I, um, I, I think we have 20, 20 minutes or 25 minutes or so. Um, and now that we've kind of been introduced to the individual characters in this, in this soundscape, eventually what we'd like to do is to, is to play it again. Um, but before that, I, if, if you'd be willing to, are you, are you down to? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I, I think it'd be great for Peter to explain a little bit about his process for making this uh, soundscape so you can learn a little about what went into this. So my um, project was, uh, what, it was nice because it didn't involve much creativity because it was all done by the scientists. So the, the top part was done by the scientists. The bottom part was done by me. 
and it was to match up the events. So on the time scale uh, is one second. So the ambient, we did take one second from every day and they're stitched together. But I didn't want to take just one second of like a bearded seal because it wouldn't make much sense to people. It didn't make sense to me. So I would take a call that I thought sounded clear. I thought it was, I guess my only creativity was I picked stuff that I thought was pretty cool. And so here, I, this is one call. It went on for a couple of seconds, and therefore it re represents like three days. And then there's a second call that represents like five. And of course, it didn't completely overlap perfectly because I, well, I wanted for everybody, including myself, to hear a complete phrase by one of these mammals. Um, so basically, the idea was to make it as re realistic what you would hear if you were actually d d down there. And I tried um, my best to refrain from putting any of m my own things. So here's the walrus. When I say my own things, my own creativity. Oh, yeah. So on the y-axis, the vertical, is a number of calling hours per day. So the scientists in the whale acoustic lab would um, have a computer software. They can figure out how many, oh, how often are they um, calling this day, or how long is the event. And so like the tallest one on like September 3rd, uh, could be heard at least during eight d different hours during the day. And so I picked something that had a fairly lou louder call to match it as best as I could. I did as le least amount of volume m manipulation so things would sound further away or up close, because of course when things were further away from the hydrophone um, it would be quieter, but there would be more reverb. You can hear it bouncing off the floor and off the ice. I think. <laughs> I always look at the scientists because I don't want to. I don't want to be saying something that's not factual. And the blue line. Okay, so on the x axis, those are the months. And each, um, each day is represented by a thin vertical line there. And then the blue corresponds, the blue line corresponds to the right y uh, vertical axis on the amount of ice cover. And I believe it um, came from a satellite, a 10 kilometer radius from where the hydrophone was placed and what percentage of that 10 kilometers was covered with sea ice. So that's what that graph is there and therefore you can see there's very little time that is open water and as what Josh was talking about these mammals are traveling when there's ice, a dangerous cracking ice there. I want to um, point out the, the beluga. And they're in the middle of January. There were some beluga calls. So when we played a, a, again, this um, l listen for that in the middle of winter, hear a, a beluga call. Um, I guess afterwards, well, I'll just ask questions um, and if people also I know I've been asking me uh, who saw the showing about how to make the in fact there was a would you mind uh, sharing how you made your um, I just want to I would I would like it um, if if Josh tonight would just share how he 
created this and where you got your idea? Because I think that would, I got um, feedback from some people who were here when we were doing a showing our rehearsal. I know they would have appreciate if you would talk about that. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, make, it, I'll make it brief. Um, Peter, thank you. Um, Josh, thank you, Lee. Uh, Ruben, um, Hector, wherever you are, Alex, Trish, uh, Qualcomm Institute, th this is really a huge privilege to be here right now. So and everyone that came out, thank you for being here. Um, uh, regarding, yeah, the thought process behind um, the imagery, I was, yeah, I was invited to um, uh, imagine uh, a kind of uh, imagery or uh, moving images, um, and I, I principally work with animation. And one of the things that I love about uh, the moving image and animation is um, that there is a kind of s visuality. There, are, there are ways of describing uh, uh, form and movement and ideas and emotion that um, can only exist as as, a, as an image that can't be like really s spoken about. Um, and the, the drawings that I made, um, I made a, a, around 400 um, ink drawings. I chose to work with ink um, because of its fluidity. Um, the ink, uh, I played with different mixtures of sea salt to uh, affect the viscosity as well as um, the, the way the ink would dry and collect. Um, I also experimented with freezing the drawings using um, dry ice so that the water would actually freeze and create really unique um, patterns, as well as um, uh, I, I drew with ice, so I actually, in some of the drawings, I, I um, applied ink and then dropped different types of ice in, uh, using, yeah, uh, and the ice would collect in, in really unique ways that I, I think have a great affinity to the ecology, um, the, uh, the uh, subject that that I guess in some ways the, the animation is um, uh, largely, um, I think about it as a, rather than creating a picture, creating like a window to look through and um, become more aware of the, the sound. So um, yeah, I, it's maybe also worth mentioning just on a kind of a very brief personal narrative. Um, I felt really lucky to be invited into this at this particular time because um, at the, the inception of the um, Arctic Immersion project um, for the, this presentation. It was the first time in uh, around 20 years that I gained um, my directional hearing. So I, uh, it was, I, my sensitivity to, like, to environmental sound was um, kind of in this recovery mode. And um, yeah, it was just a very kind of beautiful way to uh, expand my own horizon and thinking. Um, so I, yeah, I guess it was like, sorry to get weepy or like, you know, overly personal about it, but my involvement in it, it was really kind of uh, uh, precious to me in a way. Um, but yeah, I hope I answered your question um, about the, the process. And yeah, I, some of the imagery uh, was photographed using just a, like a full frame camera. Uh, the ink that's moving, I, I use like a 4K camera and a copy stand and uh, was just kind of, to a large extent, playing with different uh, uh, viscosities of ink to create different motions. And um, uh, yeah, I scanned some of the, the, the drawings. Uh, the, the frozen drawings didn't scan very well. They actually kind of melted. So um, there's a lot of trial and error, I guess, with it. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Josh. So we're going to. But you, I thought you wanted to. Oh, great. Great. I didn't, I uh, wasn't sure how. Great. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Catherine to talk about her um, process. And uh, Catherine is also from Wisconsin. So that's why this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm very familiar with the ice. <laughs> um, so I got involved with this project for, because Professor Tanias was um, a professor in one of my classes. And we got the opportunity to work with Birch Aquarium. And there um, I met Maddie Hammond, who she, he, she couldn't be here today, but she's also working um, with you guys. Yeah, <laughs> you guys just kind of looked at me blankly. I'm kind of like um, afraid to talk in public. Um, I'm like, you if I turn it. red, it's that's that's what's happening. I've actually never never asked you the question. Magically, you've made these animations. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, so I guess the thinking process was, um, like you said, it is kind of like a scary um, soundscape, <laughs> like a lot of like oh, shrieking, wailing um, kind of noises. And um, I've always kind of had like a fear of the ocean, um, but I always find it really beautiful as well. So I kind of wanted to lean into like cosmic imagery because I feel like that related like so vast and like barren yet like so like maybe full of life and full of stars and um so these were created in um like a 3D modeling animation software called Blender um and then sorry um Sculptress and then I put it into Blender to animate them and um there's this really easy thing you can do where you can like um make like a sphere and then parent it to, <laughs> and then um, put it on top of all like the vertices inside the 3D model. So I didn't have to do any of that. It just did it for me. <laughs> um, and so like the animation just followed, or like the spheres just followed how the animation was going. And then um, I shone lights on it to um, kind of give it like a glimmering effect, which, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna, we're gonna have you go on this again. So this is like you've have been scientists for a while. You've learned more about your environment. And I'll, I'll, I do wanna um, mention when I first did this, I had to learn the stereo and got all this um, software assistance and guidance from a bunch of my musician friends and producers back in Madison and then I was um, fortunate to, I was taking some more jazz guitar, I'm trying to get a little bit better with that, <laughs> and, uh, and I asked my teacher, uh, do you know someone who does surround sound? And so uh, working with uh, James Neuhauser has been an excellent experience and I've even gained more technical knowledge. So surround sound, give it a three-dimensional feel to it. So as we play it again, I want you to see if you can notice that we place different events happening all around the room, and I, I become a huge surround sound fan. I'm going to ask that my parents are over there. I'm going to be asking that for Christmas, get a surround sound. I think it's only about $10,000 <laughs> for hi-fi. But I'm not going to listen to anything else anymore. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> anyway, so I like you when you're listening. We were able to put in more d data, more acoustic data than was in my original project because we can um, se separate that. So it's not as c it's not cluttered because of the surround sound. So just observe that different placement of different events occurring. And then also we did some, um, in the fall, as the, the, bo the bowheads go west in the fall, so you may notice the bowheads slowly making their way to this side. And in the spring, the, the bowheads are going east towards the phytoplankton and the, the zoo zooplankton that feeds on them. And so they'll be going to your right on the second half of the video. Um, so with that, I wanted to uh, try it uh, again if, um, of Ruben. If you could play the, sh the ship and then keep silence. I, I really, um, we have this program here, but you decided not to print it off to save paper and but I, on, it, on it I have um, you are left alone and isolated for a year in an inhospitable place on earth for humans um, placed in frigid water and abandoned with a harp instrument that's the high frequency um, recording package for one year with just the ability to hear. And the floor is 
silk collections for thousands of years with, as um, Josh mentioned, with crab and other crustaceans. And for 10 months, you covered with thick ice. And so the journey begins.
some questions, yeah. All right, great, thank you very much. Um, so I would just like to mention uh, one very important um, uh, uh, collaborator, Madeline uh, Hannum, is not here today because of a family emergency, but she, um, uh, Maddie is a, a, a student who got her bachelor's in civil and environmental engineering uh, at University of Notre Dame and is currently a PhD candidate uh, studying physical oceanography at Scripps. Uh, so with that, I would like to invite all four of you to come up stage and um, uh, we welcome uh, audience. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to address to them. Yes. You might need Can you remind them to walk up to the mics? Uh, Peter, uh, what were the explosive noises? Was that naval ordnance or uh, seismic oil company ex exploration? Um, I, I was just informed to make sure I'm by a microphone. Okay, okay. so when we talk, we need to come here. <laughs> um, yeah, you, I, if you could re re repeat what you Yeah, what, what's the explosive noises? Is that ice or oil company exploration, seismic exploration, or uh, Russian Navy, or what? <laughs> no, um, in the, um, that was ice. Yeah, those l loud, door kind of sh shakes you. Yeah, um, as far as I, I know, well, I, mean, you, I don't know if you, um, I know there's been, I don't know where if you know better than I, where, where they're doing more s seismic um, exp exploration. I, I, I know they've been doing a, lo a lot. They've actually put in a platform uh, off of r r Russia. I'm not sure what's the plan, if you know that. Yeah, they're, they're in, in that, that year was um, 2015, 2016 recording season, and there wasn't any... Um, uh, petroleum exploration in the Chukchi Sea in that year, but this uh, site has a twelve now twelve year time series, and so in the two thousand seven and eight and nine I don't remember exactly which ones, um, but up to up to about two thousand eleven I think it was there was seismic survey for uh, petroleum oil and gas leases in the uh, sort of central Chukchi Sea, and that would be a those sounds would be a really regular feature of the soundscape in the open water period, so in the fall, in the like August, September uh, time frame. But they're not in this particular deployment or in this uh, soundscape. Other questions? Is there, is there any way of uh, uh, coordinating above uh, surface level photography with the sounds that are being recorded underneath, in most cases, the ice, taking nothing away from the luscious abstract expressionism that we've just been party to. I, I have some thoughts on that. Uh, the, so there, there is a tremendous amount of, of satellite data that's available now just to anyone who wants to download it or take a look at the visible Earth or the the microwave um, emissions from from the Earth, and and so this is something that we we kind of thought about and talked about a little bit is um, could we take the 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 satellite data the images from that particular place which the answer is yes we can take the these various types of satellite data um, and just just look at around some radius around the site in a kind of daily, usually be like a daily um, picture of some sort. Um, so it'd be possible. I think it'd be, it'd be a really neat thing to, to try and to add into this. Although I have to say, I look at satellite data on a regular basis. Um, and, and it was the first time I saw it, um, Josh's impression of the environment um, I had a m much more powerful emotional experience than I have ever had um, looking at a at a sat satellite picture. So I, I think it, there must be a way to have to have both this artistic um, interpretation, which really sort of gets I don't know me right here, um, and then something that's really just as accurate as you could possibly make it, as much of a view as you could possibly get of that time and that place from the surface and under underwater. It's a it's a great idea. I hope I hope we can do it.
Yeah, it's, I'll an answer this one too. Do you have, do you have anything you want to? Yeah, yeah. I'll repeat the question. Oh, oh. Okay, yeah. But the the question is, um, is there some connection between the particular sounds that we're hearing from these animals and their behavior, and some context for what the animals are doing and what the sounds mean to them? Um, and the answer is, in in some cases, in some cases, yes. So, um, or at least at least there's some some pretty strong inference about some of these sounds and what the animals are doing. For example, the sounds of the bearded seals that you heard, we know um, from t decades of observation of the animals in, in, in the presence of acoustic recording, in some cases, that it's only the male bearded seals that make those, those trill-type sounds. And, and those males, aren't, they're not making them all year. They're making them primarily when the females are in estrus. And when they're making those sounds, they're not foraging. Um, and they're not traveling, they're actually staying put in one spot, and they're submerging, and they're, they're singing these or making these, these trills that individual males make a particular trill that is unique to that individual animal, and that that one animal will go back to the same spot year after year during a particular time of year, and it will make the same display and that same set repertoire of sounds. And we also know that females will then join the males and so it looks like, in that case, it's what, you, it's what you'd call a lecking system. So males will display, and then females will choose. Um, in the case of, uh, of uh, bowhead whales, there it's, it's a little harder. And, and sort of uh, belugas and whatnot, it's, it's a little harder. These, some of these sounds, like, well, belugas, for example, uh, we've been trying now, and many people have tried over the last, oh, 25 or so years to d just describe the repertoire of sounds that belugas make. And it's, it's years of grad student time and uh, scientist time, and you end up with um, the, in the inability to describe all the sounds because there are literally thousands of, of individual sounds that these animals are making. And it's so, there's so much, and it's so complex that we can't even, even at this point, can't say, well, the, the belugas in the Chukchi Sea sound different in a way we can even characterize from the belugas in, in the Beaufort Sea or in the, um, or in the Canadian Arctic. And so, so in, for some of the species, we're still at the very beginning of trying to figure out what, what context it is. Aside from, for example, with belugas again, when they're making those whistle-type sounds, they're typically on the surface. They're typically in large groups. And they're so, they appear to be socializing with one another. And so while they make clicks sort of for echolocation to presumably navigate and hunt for food, those rich um, and varied whistles they make are, they appear to be a part of their social communication. So it really depends, you know, by species. But, but that question is the, it's probably one of the most common ones is what, what are they saying? You know, what does it mean? And we still have a long way to go there. I have a question from a younger member of the audience here. How do you know what animal made each sound? <laughs> okay, I think it's I think it's me again. <laughs> That's a really good question. How do you know? Because we're just blind. We only have our ears. When we when we deploy one of these things, it's just an ear. We don't know what happened. And so that that's a really important question too. How do we know that that sound was a bearded seal, for example, or a beluga? And one of the most important things for determining, for figuring out what sound came from what, is you really have to you have to be able to see them, and you really need to be able to see, ideally, to watch the animals while they're making those sounds, and to be recording at the same time, and ideally to know there aren't any other animals around that are making those sounds. And so the, the researcher who did the descriptions of the bearded seal sounds and said, oh, these are males making these special trills, and these are individual males. Well, she sat literally for months at a time 
for years going back to this one place in Norway and she watched and she had hydrophones in the water and she watched the animals while they were making these sounds and that's how she figured it out. Sometimes we can do, we can put um, microphones or underwater microphones, hydrophones onto the animals themselves and then we can record all the sounds that the animals make and all the sounds that, most of the sounds that they hear when they're, when they're moving along and that's one of the ways that we can say, okay, well, well, you put this microphone onto, onto a beluga or onto a bowhead whale and we heard the animal making that sound and then we were lucky enough to get the microphone back. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Also, sometimes you have to guess. There's still some guessing involved and, and that guessing, there's a process for that and how you can make, a, you can make an educated guess that there, well, there aren't any other species of, of marine mammals that we would expect in, the, in this place at that time. And then that's one of the reasons that if you record over a long period of time, like over decades or a decade, then you can make stronger guesses. But there's still a little bit of guesswork involved for some of these animals. I know that the, this soundscape is a time lapse of a year of um, recording of, of the hydrophone, the harp system, um, but this is like an annual thing, like you, you're out recording every year, right? Um, could you just speak for a second about um, like why you would make a recording in such a remote region like every year and listen so carefully? I mean, I, I know it's like an obvious question, but I have to ask it. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that... that the answer is in the, you know, is in the question. The, um, when this, this place is just inaccessible for starters. You just, there, there's no way for human beings to be, uh, practically any way, to be in the remote Arctic Ocean in the winter and the, in the spring, and except for a very, very short amount of time. Um, and so, so part of the reason for making a year-long recording in the Arctic is just a, is a practical matter because you just you can't go you can only go there once a year, and so with instruments like these, one of the priorities is we'll make them so that they so that they have enough battery power and they have enough um, hard drive that they can record during the time when we just simply can't be there. Um, but then, when we record and we look at the data on, the, on scales of a year at a time, you can start to see some patterns like, well, we know that we recorded for this year and bowhead whales were there um, when there was, when the ice was starting to break up and there was some open water. And they didn't, they weren't there as much when it was open water. Well, if we do that for one year, we kind of have a, you have a sort of a guess. Well, it seems like bowhead whales are more likely to be in this marginal ice zone and they might, maybe it raises a question, do they follow that? marginal ice zone wherever it goes. And so then you have this, once you've started to record for a year, the almost, you, you immediately need more uh, in order to um, follow some of those questions through to get some answers. And so when you, when you now have recorded for 10 years and you look and you can see the, what the pattern, seasonal pattern of sea ice is, and you can see, oh wow, in fact, it's true. The bowhead whales show up just before the ice um, melts and breaks up. In fact, they show up right around the time of early melt onset, and then they stay until, gosh darn, right after the ice breaks up, and then at least at this site, they go away. And so the longer time series help you with those. But really, the, back to the, the motivation for being in this place and going through all the effort and all the expense of, of this recording, the, the, like I was saying before, this area of the, of the Arctic is changing extremely fast, um, and you see by any, you know, anybody's um, plot of the data analyzed from satellites, that the area covered by ice in the north is shrinking. Every summer, it's a, on average, it's a smaller amount of, of ice. And because these animals are, are so tied to the ice, um, there's, a, there's a real need to try to understand their relationships with it, understand what, what kind of ice what kind of uh, habitat do these animals need in order to be present, in order to survive and do their thing? Um, and by understanding the, these patterns in what makes ice habitable or what makes it um, a, a place the animals can go, it helps us to predict what places might be important in the future, what we need to look out for, where we need to look out for. 
uh, for the animals. So it's kind of the, the priority is, uh, well, you, you, have to, you have to be looking on a longer time scale to see some of those patterns. I see other uh, hands being raised, but uh, uh, it's a few minutes after uh, 6 o'clock, so uh, I think what I would like to do is to try to finish this and then invite everyone to the reception and ask uh, more questions. I see Professor John Hildebrand in, in the audience. He's the, really the person who spearheaded the, the research and just want to acknowledge him. Um, let's give a wave to everyone know where you are. Um, uh, I did mention earlier that this is only the first of the three series that are uh, inspired by, by this lab's research. And the second one will be on um, May 9th. Uh, it's a performance featuring uh, our grad students from the music department, Peter Sloan, uh, and from visual art program, uh, uh, Grace Sarah Grothos. Uh, they pr created a work uh, uh, with Josh help, um, and it's a work entitled Rice, and uh, we'd like to invite you to that one. And the last of the three is on May 29th. Uh, in fact, th those are uh, performances of uh, pieces written by the PhD students in my seminar right now who are also working with uh, Professor Hildebrand's um, resources. Um, that involves about 20 or uh, 22 uh, graduate students from all different fields in the music department, from performance to, to composition to uh, computer music. Um, basically what it comes down to is that uh, for musicians like us, a composer like myself, uh, uh, what's important is what is the material you're using. Traditionally, we're using a violin, we're using a piano, now we have these sounds to deal with, right? Uh, what what uh, uh, kind of technique do you use? Do you write a fugue? Do you write a four-part chorale? And here, what kind of technology is called for uh, to do justice to this kind of sound, right? And the last thing is, what is the concept? Why do we need this music? And it is very much because of the nature of this university and the collaborative spirit uh, of the lab and, and also our department, especially uh, uh, QI, uh, the Qualcomm Institute and Director Ramesh Rao, that we are able to pursue these collaborative projects that I don't think could ever exist in traditional departments. So I want to just uh, thank everyone for, for that support. Uh, and could we um, thank the collaborators, the artists and, and scientists uh, one more time and welcome you to join us at the reception. Thank you. Thank you.